Witten family came to Nova Scotia in 1761 from New Hampshire, part of the planter settlement. And of course, they settled in the Truro area uh, initially. Then the son David moved in 1795 to the Maitland area in order to engage in shipbuilding, according to the records. So for some generations following that period of time, there were Widden families here in the Maitland Selma area. And of course, when the World Wars came along, some of them stepped up. This picture shows one of these Whidden families, David Arthur Whidden and his wife Etta, Etta Hamilton, and their older children. And, and this family experienced not just from war, but from other circumstances, a significant amount of tragedy in their lives, which is one of the things that I will discuss in this uh, presentation. Here we can see their older children, Brown Widden, uh, interesting name, Brown Widden. He was named for the local doctor, Samuel Dennison Brown, who would have delivered him back in 1892. Be in front of him is his younger brother, Eric, um, on the right, the brother, Benjamin, and in the middle, their sister, Anna. <clears throat> Eric went off to war in 1917, and his wartime experience was relatively short. Uh, he, as you can see, was uh, was suffering from medical issues and <clears throat> ultimately was discharged from the service in August, not long before the war was over, uh, because of his medical condition. Uh, what he was suffering from was tuberculosis. And it's interesting when you start reading a lot of the uh, records that are there concerning service during the military, during the war. Uh, the, the number of young men who suffered from all kinds of uh, miserable ailments, like pneumonia, like measles, like uh, this guy who developed tuberculosis. And of course, uh, ultimately, when you got closer to the end of the war, uh, the, the big uh, killer was uh, the Spanish flu. Uh, fortunately, none of these gentlemen uh, were ones who suffered from that. His brother, Benjamin, was quite young. Uh, he was barely 17, if that, when he was attested in Halifax. And he had multiple medical issues all the while he was overseas. And of course, ultimately, he was wounded uh, at the Battle of uh, Corselet. Um, these injuries turned out to be fatal for him in the sense that uh, after he was discharged following the war, he died um, in 1920. And the, his death was the result of the injuries that he had received when he was overseas. Um, a young man who had not ever really had a chance to get out and see the world. And his first view of the world was to be thrown into a World War situation. And this is the man, Brown Whidden, who really makes the family story, the tragedy that it is. And if you remember, when we looked at the picture first, we noted that uh, Brown would seem to be the oldest. Well, Brown uh, was preceded by a, a brother um, who died very shortly after birth. And consequently, this constituted the first blow to the family, their firstborn son, uh, who did not uh, survive even into childhood, young childhood. Brown Whidden um, 
before the war had started, he had gone off to the United States to work. He was working in Boston, and uh, <clears throat> and in 1915, I believe it was, he came home from Boston on vacation, and he died. And this picture with the accompanying uh, uh, words appeared in the Truro News that fall, indicating that uh, on the Wednesday afternoon of uh, September 8, Brown Widden had gone off hunting, it was assumed. He was carrying a rifle as well as a 22 caliber revolver. And would anybody who had seen him please contact David Widden? Halifax Papers, please copy. Uh, David Widden was a sea captain, his father, and um, ultimately when Brown's body was found, um, his father was on a, on a transport run to St. John um, and came home to that terrible news. However, September the 8th, um, he went out, Brown went out, and uh, was not seen again. Later that month, September 29th, uh, a further item appears in the uh, Truro paper. The disappearance of Brown Widden, son of Captain David Widden, still remains a mystery. And it recounts the uh, circumstances under which he seemed to have left the house and goes on to say that large parties of men have searched the forest near his home, but with no result. And again, describes what he was wearing and what he looked like. He was only 23 years old. Um, he was, uh, uh, you know, he the search party was out of probably out of the uh, shipyards and uh, whatnot of the Maitland area. Uh, lots of uh, people who were able to get out and go look for him, uh, but nobody found him. It's not until November 1st that his body is discovered. And that because two men uh, Mr. Lock Burns, and I know it says Lock Burns uh, in this uh, newspaper article, but I suspect that should be two words. And his son-in-law, a gentleman by the surname Beach, were out hunting themselves. And this is what they state. The body was resting in a cradle hill with the rifle between the knees pointing upward. There was a gunshot wound in the throat and the bullet passed through the head. Dr. Creelman, who was the doctor at the time in Maitland, uh, convened a, a coroner's jury, and the resulting verdict was accidental death. The thing is, when, when you think about it, uh, here is this man's mother and father having lost one child long enough back that you know, you, you wouldn't really think it would still resonate with them, especially since uh, deaths following childbirth were much more common than they are today. Uh, but two sons off at war, because this is 1915 we're talking about, and uh, one of the boys had already gone to war, and the, that was Benjamin, and the other was going to be on his way. And uh, what, does, what does that do to a family? Uh, you know, to have this young man found out in the, not in the, even in the woods, he was apparently found um, along a fence line and local belief is that the, uh, the gun actually uh, was caught in the fence and uh, triggered accidentally. Um, but Aunt Etta and David, as uh, my my in-laws would have referred to him as, uh, obviously would be quite devastated by this loss. And then um, just five years later, more or less, to lose Benjamin Widden, uh, who died as a result of his injuries, would be another blow to the family. And I know that uh, my sister-in-law, uh, Catherine 
Catherine Widden Tyrrell, uh, when I asked her about this event, uh, which she didn't really know anything about, um, but she said the adults in the family when she was growing up always said something to the effect that Aunt Etta never got over it and the it was never really very well defined and in her genealogy on the Widden family, Helen Widden uh, merely says about Brown Widden's death, and I quote, he died in young manhood. And there is nothing there to suggest the tragedy that this event was. Arthur Widden, and his brother Alan, for whom I do not have a picture, uh, were the youngest children in the family. And when World War II came along, Arthur and Alan both uh, signed up. And of course, uh, uh, Alan survived the event. Unfortunately, Arthur, while he was posted in England, developed tuberculosis. And as a result, he was uh, returned to Halifax, where he died in the uh, Halifax Military Hospital on Cogswell Street uh, in 1945. That's the sad story of this family of Widdens. Augustus Lawrence Widden was brother to my father-in-law, Ken Widden, and his, his father died in 1914, I think it was, uh, when Gus was quite young, but Gus became the, as the oldest boy, he became the breadwinner of the family. Um, and I'm going to read you just a little bit that he wrote in his, uh, in his memoirs. Uh, about his war experience. And you'll see he's dressed in a Highland uniform, complete with kilt and sporran. And this is what he says. He talks initially about being 15 years old um, and so on at the time that he starts this memoir and what happened to his father. But then he says, in the meantime, the war was continuing and all my friends were joining the army. And that would have included his cousins, which were just down the road from him. I was trying to persuade my mother to let me join up too. She resisted for a long time, but when I was 18 and we were hard up, she gave her permission. I went to Halifax and joined the 246th Highland Battalion. We started training at the armories, but they shipped us to Aldershot in April 1917, where we got more training before we were put on draft for England. We left on the Olympic, a very large ship in those days. I stayed in a tent with the men I thought were my friends, but they stole my wallet with $8 in it, so I left Canada without the means to relieve my hunger, which was acute at times. After six days on the ocean where I, with a lot more, were seasick all the time, we arrived in Liverpool and were loaded on trains of small compartment cars. We arrived in Whitby Camp, Surrey, England in June. To my way of thinking, it was the most beautiful country I would ever see. He goes on further on in the uh, memoir to write this. England's climate was miserable, especially for men dressed in kilts, because they caused even, and they caused even more problems in France. The pleats were a home for lice, but they, meaning the big boys, figured looks were more important than comfort. We were at Whitby until the spring of 1918 when the 5th Division was broken up and we were put on draft for France. About that time, I took the measles and was sent to hospital and missed that draft. By the time I got through the various convalescent homes and back on draft again, it was the 1st of July, 1918, when I arrived in Boulogne. From there, we were sent to Etape and then started to march to join our battalion. There was no organization to feed us on the way, 
It was over country with no civilian population, so we lived for a week mostly on bully beef that had been discarded along the roads by passing troops. We joined the 85th Battalion just after they had been in a battle. The Canadians were being used that summer as shock troops. When there was a push on, they were used and then shifted to another part of the line for the next attack. He goes on to say that they were moved to another part of the line and subsequently marched elsewhere. And then he says, we were moved to another part of the front and went over the top, which consisted of being in front of the line early in the morning about daylight. They, meaning uh, his troops, always shelled the German lines with thousands of guns. We were ready. Uh, to climb over the parapet and take the Germans' front line. However, they did not play the game very fairly. They would go in, meaning the Germans, would go in their dugouts till our barrage lifted and then come up and man their machine guns. So we would meet the bullets and lots of them. We lost half of the battalion, 400 men out of 800. But as the high brass would say, the morale of the troops was excellent. Then from there, they moved to Cambria, and this is where he says, I got a blighty. And a blighty is a wound which required hospitalization in England, along late in the afternoon. A bunch of us had stayed behind a railroad embankment. We were firing our rifles at German planes overhead. One of the planes swooped down with his machine guns blazing. He got me with a bullet through the fleshy part of the shoulder. It came out under my arm. It was not a serious wound, but the doctor back at the resting sorry, the dressing station posted me for England and said if the bullet had been a fraction higher, it would have severed the artery in the shoulder. I was glad to get out of the carnage. I was sent to a hospital in the south of England near Reading. The food and service was good and a welcome change from dodging shells and bombs in France. And of course, by that time, the war was nearly over. And by the time he was ready to be drafted back into active service, there was no active service for him to be drafted back into. And as a consequence, he was uh, ultimately returned to Canada. Um, the, I mean, this, this, these were... Uncle Gus was a cousin to these other men that I spoke of earlier, um, and his whole wartime experience, I'm sure, was one that uh, he never, ever forgot because he wrote this memoir quite late in his life. Um, he didn't remain in Nova Scotia very long. Uh, I think he was here probably, well, he was here into the 19, early 1940s, um, at which point he decided that farming in Maitland wasn't where his future was going to lie. He was married by that point, and so he packed up his uh, young family and moved uh, to Ontario, and subsequently um, to British Columbia, where the extended family still remains. It's interesting to note that Uncle Gus's family, none of his family, of course, entered the military, but his sister, younger sister Lucy's son, David, David McSwain, did. Um, Lucy left Nova Scotia, went to Boston and trained as a nurse and married there and, and never returned to Nova Scotia to live. Um, her, their son David uh, did join the did join the American Army. He served in Korea and he served following that um, in in Germany um, with the uh, with the peacekeeping uh, NATO Corps uh, with the uh, of the US Army and I am sad, sad to note that um, prior to this uh, presentation on November the 8th David passed away in Franklin Massachusetts at age 92. Gus's younger brother, Ken, 
never did any active service. Even if he'd been old enough, he would not have been eligible because he suffered quite badly from asthma uh, as a as a ma as a young man. Uh, however, his young uh, grandson, Ken's young grandson, uh, Gus's great nephew, um, Andrew, um, is currently serving in the Canadian Armed Forces, stationed in Kingston, Ontario. Um, and has had two tours of duty in Afghanistan. So there is a bit of a family um, connection in the sense that uh, uh, Widden served in both wars and continue to offer their service in one way or another um, to the military uh, in subsequent generations. I'd like to also point out that um, um, it wasn't just the men in the families who served during the World War. Um, it would be another cousin, Helen Widden, um, whom we all know as the uh, author of the Widden family history, as well as the re revision of the Smith family history in Selma. And uh, she was brought up as the daughter of a, of a, ch a church minister and consequently moved in a variety of different places. But uh, she trained in nursing and she served in France as well. Uh, during World War One, we don't have much in the way of information about her service. Um, I mean, uh, Helen, I met her in the early 70s after I married uh, my husband John, and a lovely woman who was well into her 90s at that point and lived into her early 100s uh, before she passed away, um, and used to spend her time between uh, California, where she had a, a brother living, and uh, Nova Scotia, where she had a house in Milford. And she um, was always on the go looking for genealogy material, taking notes, and we have a, quite a collection of her information here in the museum. Um, she served as a nurse and then lived in France for some years afterward and then returned to pick up her medical career here in Nova Scotia. Um, she was uh, um, definitely, as I said, she was definitely a very private person in the sense that she did not leave, at least as far as the family here in Nova Scotia was concerned, anything much in the way of uh, pictures, no pictures, uh, and no memoirs of her life either. I'd like to point out too that uh, the memoir that Gus wrote that I mentioned and read from uh, is available for your pleasure, your reading pleasure on our website um, under the local history uh, uh, memoirs. And I'd invite you please to um, have a look at it. Uh, so thank you very much for listening to this presentation.